How to Pray by R. A. Torrey. Chapter 4, being read by Peter John Parisi, also known as Brian Dean. Praying in the name of Christ and according to the will of God. Number 1. It was a wonderful word about prayer that Jesus spoke to his disciples on the night before his crucifixion. Quote, Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Unquote. Prayer in the name of Christ has power with God. God is well pleased with his Son, Jesus Christ. He hears him always, and he also hears always the prayer that is really in his name. There is a fragrance in the name of Christ that means acceptance, acceptable to God, every prayer that bears it. <clears throat> but what is it to pray in the name of Christ? Many explanations have been attempted that to ordinary minds do not explain. But there is nothing mystical or mysterious about this expression. If one will go through the Bible and examine all the passages in which the expression, quote, in my name, unquote, or, quote, in his name, unquote, or synonymous expressions are used, he will find that it means just about what it does in modern usage. If I go to the bank and hand in a check with my name signed to it, I ask of that bank in my own name. If I have money deposited in the bank, the check will be cashed. If not, it will not be. If, however, I go to the bank with somebody else's name signed on the check, I am asking in his name, and it does not matter whether I have money in that bank or any other. If the person whose name is signed to the check has money there, the check will be cashed. If, for example, I should go to the First National Bank of Chicago and present a check which I had signed for $50, the paying teller would say to me, Why, Mr. Torrey, we cannot cash that. You have no money in this bank. But if I go to the First National Bank with a check for $5,000 made payable to me and signed by one of the largest depositors in that bank, they would not ask whether I had money in that bank or in the, any other bank, but would honor the check at once. So it is when I go to the Bank of Heaven, where I go to God in prayer. I have nothing deposited there. I have absolutely no credit there. And if I go in my own name, I will get absolutely nothing. But Jesus Christ has unlimited credit in heaven. And he has gained and granted to me the privilege of going to the bank with his name on my checks. And when I thus go, my prayers will be honored to any extent. To pray then in the name of Christ is to pray on the ground, not on my credit, but his. To renounce the thought that I have any claim on God, whatever, and approach him on the ground of God's claims. Praying in the name of Christ is not merely adding the phrase, quote, I ask these things in Jesus' name, unquote, to my prayer. I may put that phrase, phrase in my prayer and really be resting on my own merits all the time. But when I really do approach God on the ground, but not on the ground of my merit, but on the ground of Christ's merit, not on the ground of my goodness, but on the ground of the atoning blood, Hebrews 10:19, God will hear me. Very much of our modern prayer is vain because men approach God imagining that they have some claim upon God whereby he is under obligation to answer their prayers. Years ago, when Mr. Moody was young in Christian work, he visited a town in Illinois. A judge in the town was an infidel. This judge's wife besought Mr. Moody to call upon her husband. But Mr. Mr. Moody replied, I cannot talk with your husband. I am only an uneducated young Christian, and your husband is a book infidel. But the woman would not take no for an answer. So Mr. Moody made the call. The clerks in the other office tittered as the young salesman from Chicago walked in to talk with the scholarly judge. The conversation was short. Mr. Moody said, Judge, I can't talk with you. You are a book infidel and I have no learning. But I simply want to say, if you are ever converted, I want you to let me know. The judge replied, Yes, young man. If I am ever converted, I will let you know. Yes, I will let you know. The conversation ended. The clerks tittered the still louder with the zealous young Christian left the office, but the judge was converted within a year. Mr. Moody, visiting the town again, asked the judge to explain how it came about. The judge said, quote, One night when my wife was at a prayer meeting, I began to grow very uneasy and miserable. I did not know what was the matter with me, but finally retired before my wife came home. I could not sleep all that night. I got up early, told my wife that I would eat no breakfast, and went down to the office. I told the clerks they could take a holiday and shut myself up in the inner office. I grew, kept growing more and more miserable. And finally, 
I got down and asked God to forgive my sins. But I would not say, for Jesus' sake, for I was a Unitarian, and I did not believe the atoning. I kept praying, God, forgive my sins, but no answer came. At last, in desperation, I cried, O oh God, for Christ's sake, forgive my sins, and found peace at once. The judge had no access to God until he came in the name of Christ. But when he thus came, he was heard and answered at once. Number two, great light is thrown upon the subject, how to pray. By 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 through 15, quote, And this is the boldness which we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he heareth us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions which we had asked of him, unquote, R.B. This passage teaches us plainly that if we are to pray aright, we must pray according to God's will. Then will we, beyond a peradventure, get the thing we ask of him. But can we know the will of God? Can we know that any specific prayer is according to his will? We most certainly can. How? Number one, first by the word. God has revealed his will in his word. When anything is definitely promised in the word of God, we know that it is his will to give that thing. If, then, when I pray, I can find some definite promise of God's word and lay that promise before God, I know that he hears me. And if I know that he hears me, I know that I have the petition that I have asked of him. For example, when I pray for wisdom, I know that it is the will of God to give me wisdom. For he says so in James chapter 1, verse 5. Quote, If any of you act wisdom, let him ask of God to give to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given unto him. Unquote. So when I ask for wisdom, I know that the prayer is heard, and that wisdom will be given me. In like manner, when I pray for the Holy Spirit, I know from Luke chapter 11, verse 13, that it is God's will that my prayer is heard, and that I have the petition I have asked of him. Quote, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Unquote. Some years ago, a minister came to me at the close of an address on prayer at a YMCA Bible school and said, You have produced upon those young men the impression that they can ask for definite things and get the very things that they ask. I replied that I did not know whether they, that was the impression that I produced or not, but that was certainly the impression that I desired to produce. But, he replied, that is not right. We cannot be sure, for we don't know God's will. I turned him at once to James 1.5 and read it and said to him, Is it not God's will to give us wisdom? And if you ask for wisdom, do you not know that you are going to get it? Ah, he said, we don't know what wisdom is. I said, no, if we did, we would not need to ask. But whatever wisdom may be, don't you know that you will get it? Certainly, it is our privilege to know. When we have a specific promise in the word of God, if we doubt that it is God's will, or if we doubt that God will do the thing that we ask, we make God a liar. Here is one of the greatest secrets of prevailing prayer. To study the word to find that God's will is as revealed here in the promises, and then simply take these promises and spread them out before God in prayer with the absolutely unwavering expectation that he will do what he has promised in his word. Number two, but there is still another way in which we may know the will of God, that is, by the teaching of his Holy Spirit. There are many things that we need from God which are not covered by any specific promise, but we are not left in ignorance of the will of God even then. In Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27, we are told, quote, And in like manner the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself maketh intercessions for us with groanings, which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God, unquote, R.V. Here we are distinctly told that the Spirit of God prays in us, draws out our prayer in the line of God's will. When we are thus led by the Holy Spirit in any direction to pray for any given object, we may do it in all confidence that it is God's will and that we are to get the very thing we ask of Him, even though there is no specific promise to cover the case. Often God, by His Spirit, lays upon us a heavy burden of prayer, 
for some given individual. We cannot rest. We pray for him with groanings which cannot be uttered. Perhaps the man is entirely beyond our reach, but God hears the prayer. And in many a case, it is not long before we hear his definite conversion. The passage, 1 John 5, verse 14 and 15, is one of the most abused passages in the Bible. Quote, This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he heareth us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions we have desired of him. Unquote. The Holy Spirit, beyond a doubt, put it into the Bible to encourage our faith. It begins with, quote, This is the confidence that we have in him, unquote. And closes with, quote, We know that we have the petitions that we have desired of him, unquote. But one of the most frequent uses of this passage, which was so magnificently given to beget confidence, is to introduce an element of uncertainty into our prayers. Oftentimes, when one lacks his confidence in prayer, some cautious brother will come and say, Now, don't be too confident. If it is not God's will, he will not do it. But if it is God's will, he will do it. You should put in, if it be thy will. Doubtless, there are many times when, when we do not know the will of God. And in all prayer, submission to the excellence of uh, will of God should underlie it. But when we know God's will, there be no no ifs. And this passage will not was not put into the Bible in order that we might introduce ifs into our prayers, but in order that we might throw our ifs to the wind and have confidence and know that we have the petitions which we have asked of him.